Good evening, everyone. My name is Hunter Ohanian, and I'm the Executive Director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archives located here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And for those of you in the rest of the country, uh, it does rain here in Southern Florida. We've had rain now for four days and uh, we're all a little bit soggy, a little, a little wet, but it's all, it's all pr pretty good down here. Um, today is May 26, 2020, and this is, I think, the fourth installment of a series of online conversations that we've been having with artists, writers, uh, critics, and curators. And with us tonight is Julio Campo. Julio. Hi, how's everyone doing? Hi, nice to see you. Well, it's nice to, to be in this space um, during this difficult time and to be able to have these important conversations. Thank you to you, Hunter, and for Stonewall for, for having me. Thanks. Well, we're really happy to have you here. Um, just a few things. Uh, Julie and I will be speaking about a number of things. And if you're here and he'll be doing some reading from his book, Welcome to Fairyland. And uh, if you have questions, we're going to keep all those for the last 15 minutes. Oh, yes, it, there it is. We have our copies of it. We're ready here with that wonderful sergeant painting on the cover. If anybody ever gets into the MFA again in Boston, go see the show. And, uh, um, and, um, and then we'll have quick questions. So hang on to your questions or throw them into the, into the Q&A or the chat pile, uh, wherever you see them, and do that. Um, just a little bit about Stonewall, if you're new to us. We're located here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We're one of the largest LGBTQ libraries in the world. Uh, 28,000 volumes in our library. And our archives have 2,700 linear feet of materials, uh, which totals more than 6 million individual pages. Um, so if you go to our website, I'll probably mention it a few times, but if you go to our website, uh, stonewall-museum.org, you can see about our past exhibitions and our upcoming exhibitions. You can actually search to see if a book that we have is in, your li is in our li library that you're interested in. You can see descriptors of a lot of the things in our archives. And also, if you live in other parts of the country, uh, we have a wonderful additional resource page there, and you might even find a queer archive close to you somewhere uh, if you're not here in South Florida. But if you are, please definitely come to see us. Uh, as we all know, we're now in the, I think, the middle or the end of the second month of a worldwide pandemic. Um, today, on October 26th, um, there are over 25 million people who have been, who are unemployed as a result of this. And um, all, all indicators are that the number of deaths in the United States, States will reach 100,000 people um, within the next few days. And so um, for historical reasons, uh, people need to know that this has been a real shutdown that's happened in the United States. Um, the Congress of the United States has allocated uh, $2.3 trillion um, uh, trying to help the economy. Um, it could not have happened, um, I don't know when is a good time to happen, but it could not have happened at a, at a more difficult time in the middle of a presidential election because it has obviously stilted a lot of growth and conversation. Um, and I think also people are, are beginning to see a lot of the classism that is inherent in society that maybe many of us have seen before, that this is now shining a brighter light on that, where they're seeing the haves and the have-nots are being treated differently in this whole process. So this will be talked about for many years to come, but know that you're looking at something in which we are really um, at the point which this, is, uh, this has really been something that we all have lived through. Um, here in South Florida, as in other parts of the country, things are beginning to open up. I think I saw on TV today that uh, they were actually doing trading on the floor of the New York Stock uh, Exchange. Uh, that's been closed for eight weeks. Um, and uh, here in South Florida, things are opening up. Stonewall Library will be opening up probably in two weeks at least, but part-time, so we're happy about that. So Julio, let me start with you and uh, sort of ask you the question. You're here, you're in Wilton Manor, uh, Manners here in uh, in Fort Lauderdale, and um, how has the um, how has the pandemic affected you? Um, well, I just want to echo and you know uh, the powerful statement you just made that this is not just historic, but I think also it's important for us to, um, as a historian and as a scholar and as a person, just generally, I think about the past a lot. Um, and I, I, one of the things that I hope that we all take from this is how resilient we are as a community, a community broadly defined, and uh, how much we can find solace and, and support and solidarity and 
uh, how people have overcome difficult situations. This is a very difficult time uh, for, for so many. And, uh, you know, questions of isolation, questions of, of community and questions of, of you know, uh, so, so many insecurity at large, whether financial or, or emotional, um, that this is a time to reach out and to, to continue to build and support communities uh, at large. And, you know, I think we all find our ways to, you know, we all struggle with, with those moments. Um, and I, I think that we also have to continue to, to realize that we are, um, we are always stronger together. And I know those things sound kind of cliche and, and kind of, um, but it's just so true. And it, it, I think I've found uh, so much peace and, and serenity and, and finding, uh, you know, happiness in small things that we, we often take for granted and, and our friends and our community. Um, so I, I'm very fortunate to say that I've uh, been able to find that uh, during, this, these, during these weeks that of course have remained difficult, but um, you know, reaching out to people I hadn't spoken to in a long time and, and, and finding new, new forms and new bonds that, that have, um, you know, had since kind of dissipated a little bit. So, um, but other than that, I mean, things are, things are moving along. Now, you were saying you were moving and you were able to settle into your apartment in Wilton Manor, so that or your new home in Wilton Manor, so that's nice too. Yeah, I was at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, uh, UMass Amherst, for the last eight years, uh, and I I joined uh, the faculty at FIU in the history department uh, and joined the public humanities program, the, the Wilsonian Public Humanities Lab uh, here at FIU. Um, so it's it's great to be. I'm, I was born and raised in Miami, so it's great to be back home in South Florida. Um, I miss my gay softball league here. I miss, uh, I was an intern at Stonewall uh, almost 15 years ago during graduate school. And, uh, you know, we again, we find homes in a number of different ways and we find community and, and people in a lot of different ways that, that have always been meaningful to me and certainly to, to so many others. So, um, you know, being in this moment, of course, I moved to Wilton Manors in late November. Uh, I was telling Hunter earlier, uh, got me to finally unpack my boxes. So, um, <laughs> Uh, it kept me busy for a little while as we, you know, remo moved to remote teaching during the semester and, and uh, you know, kind of saw all this transition before our eyes. Sure. Well, just to let our audience know a little bit more about your background, I'm sure many of them do know about you, but uh, you are a transnational historian whose research and teaching interests include modern U.S. history, especially the United States relationship to the Caribbean and Latin America. You've also addressed how gender and sexuality have historically intersected with constructions of ethnicity, ethnicity, race, class, nation, age, and ability. Your work, uh, Welcome to Fairyland, which we're going to talk about today, uh, University, University of North Carolina Press? UNC, yeah. UNC, um, 19, or 2017, has received six awards. Um, which is just amazing, including uh, the Charles Snyder Award from the Southern Historic Association for the best book written on Southern history. That's really sort of astonishing, particularly for a book called Welcome to Fairyland, <laughs> Near Miami before uh, 1940. Um, and of course, you're, you've won many other awards. And so um, where did you get your PhD? At FIU, at Florida International. Um, I did my undergraduate work at NYU, and then I was a journalist locally. I, I wrote and produced the morning news for WSBN Channel 7, uh, and then WPLG at Channel 10. Uh, and I kind of decided I wanted to be a better journalist, so I started going to, you know, essentially night school. You know, uh, the, I went to like one evening class as a non-degree seeking student locally at FIU. Um, and I stuck around and I got a PhD and I, I got my, I did my postdoc at Yale and then got my first job at UMass Amherst. Um, right. Yeah, I've been fortunate. So let's talk about Fairyland. Uh, how did this book come about? You know, so when you're, uh, when you work in academia, you often revise uh, your dissertation, uh, which is, you know, what you write to your thesis that you write as you're finishing your, as you're doing your PhD. Uh, and my, uh, my, my dissertation was a history of uh, LGBT Miami post-1945. It was the 40s until about the 90s, almost, you know, early 2000s. Uh, and as I was revising it as a postdoc, I realized that in order to really understand uh, that history post-1945, what Miami looked like after World War II and how once people start identifying as having you know, gay identities, as being lesbian, as being transgender, 
which is a very modern phenomenon. That's something that really only happens in the historical record. Um, you know, people have always had same sex sex. So they've always had, there are certain kind of characteristics that we might associate, but the, the idea of understanding yourself as, as having a particular sexual identity is a really modern thing, right? Um, and in some ways, studying that could be a little bit easier because people are telling you, hey, look at me in this record, I'm this or I'm that. Um, prior to, to the 40s, even, and sometimes even during that time, it's harder. You're really looking at, uh, instead of identities or the way that people present themselves, you're looking at behaviors. So you're looking at what kind of you know, things that people were doing, what were they wearing. Uh, this, is, this is harder and it makes you rely much more heavily um, on things like police records, on, on so you know, always through the lens of criminality or through surveillance. Uh, um, and I, so anyway, as I was revising that, I realized that I was starting the story kind of midpoint and I went back uh, to the archives. Uh, as a transnational historian, I've always understood that Miami uh, while, of course, the city of the United States wasn't just a part of the United States, but also a city of the Americas. Um, I went back to uh, some of the archives I had visited in the Caribbean, uh, Cuba and Haiti, for example, that had played a key role in shaping Miami's LGBTQ history uh, after the 40s and 50s, really in 60s, 70s, no doubt, beyond that. Uh, and I went to the Bahamas. And when I was, uh, you know, doing that research, I realized that there was a, a very textured, uh, a very important history um, about Miami's early queer history that hadn't been told, that we didn't know. Uh, and I, I, I went to the sodomy, uh, you know, I went to the criminal records and found sodomy cases that took me in a completely new direction. And I realized that I, instead of revising that dissertation, that I needed to write a different book. I needed to focus more heavily on what queer Miami looked like. You know, Miami's a, a very new city. It was incorporated as a city uh, just in 1896. So, uh, you know, it has a different... Uh, relationship to uh, industrialization. Miami's never an industrial city. Uh, it's, it's part of the South, but it's also not a part of the South. Um, you know, it has, it takes advantage of Southern customs like uh, Jim Crow racial segregation, um, but it's also, of course, a city of the Americas. And from its very early start, um, the influence of places like Cuba, of the Bahamas, of Haiti, were always really important to shaping the way that people understood their sexual desires, uh, the way that the, the city itself kind of unfolded and, and created space for people or, or didn't create space for people. Um, sure. So it was how I kind of went about doing that. Well, let's start with a section uh, in your book uh, about the uh, impact of immigration and Bahamians uh, in Miami. And if you'd like to read that uh, section from there, that would be great. Sure. Do you mean page um, 72, right? Yep. Right? Yeah, I think so. I think you do. I don't know. Page 72. Page 72. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I'll just kind of briefly introduce where, you know, where I'm at and what I'm, what I'm talking about here. Uh, so one of the things that I've, I've always been really interested in doing, and I, I got the chance to do this with this book, was to bring a number of different conversations together. That is, uh, I had been a little frustrated sometimes by the way that people talk about LGBTQ history as somehow being niche, as somehow being outside of, um, and I wanted to uh, uh, put at the center of the story uh, histories of incarceration, histories of immigration, of race relations, um, which of course have always been uh, LGBTQ issues. And one of the things that I came across uh, was that I was looking at the criminal records, um, those, uh, the Bahamas, bah people who came from the Bahamas, especially the Northern part of the Bahamas in the early 1900s, uh, were, uh, were largely represented, uh, overrepresented actually, in Miami's early criminal cases for sodomy and crimes against nature. Um, part Black Bahamian men uh, were, were, even though they, they were a small part of the population in Miami, actually found that there were a significant number of those cases that were recorded for things like sodomy. So I was, uh, it's not of course to say, and as the evidence, as I continue to look into this, right, the evidence suggested, of course, not that Bahamian men were any more likely to have same-sex sex or to have sod to engage in sodomy than others, but rather that as Black uh, men and as immigrant men, they were much more likely to be policed for it. Um, so I was looking at the different ways that U.S. immigration law also changed as a um, through through this period, and what we see is the United States is is kind of unique in some ways. Canada had something similar uh, in regulating people, and, and certainly other nation states had this. Uh, 
people who they read as undesirable. And some of those people were people who engaged in same-sex sex or who had been accused of, of, of engaging in same-sex sex. Uh, the United States would even pass a law in 1952 barring homosexual foreigners from entering the country, something that would be the law of our land uh, officially until 1990. And there's still all sorts of regulations that we see, not just the remnants of, but, but they're, uh, you know, they, we live with these stories, you know, with these stories and these experiences, uh, certainly to this day. Um, so I was looking at how uh, Black Bahamian men played such a key role in, in seeing the kind of different ways that people were being policed, right, uh, for their sexuality in this, in this moment. So I'll read this here from, uh, from the book. The oversaturation of single, able-bodied Bahamian men in Miami helped forge a queer erotic focused on the black labor masculinity, perceived hyper uh, masculinity and hypersexuality. His body and the labor it produced became a valued commodity in the new city. A white male gaze centered on a Bahamian man and its physical possibilities. Often erotic and sensual, this gaze inventoried and made legible his physical strength, his vigor, his subservience and his ability to be disciplined. Um, so I, I'll, I'll stop just there because I, I feel like it requires some kind of unpacking and maybe this might be a good way of getting into Vizcaya, is that? Um, sure, sure. Is that, I don't sure. know, that's what you wanted to do. <laughs> the, so the image for instance that comes from the, from, it's the cover, is, a, is an image taken from John Singh, it's a, it's a portrait, right? Uh, a watercolor, excuse me, uh, made by famed artist John Singer Sargent who's probably best known for painting the elite, European elite and American elite. Uh, he painted two presidents, for instance. He was a portraiture um, as well. Later on, he kind of said he hated some of those portraits and, and big portraits in general. Um, he did uh, Teddy Roosevelt's portrait. He did um, Woodrow Wilson's. I mean, so he's kind of quite famous, but he was also, and this is an image of, it's hard to see from here, but that's Vizcaya in the, in the background. Uh, and, the, the owner of Vizcaya, which is, you know, the, the kind of famed, still kind of in pristine condition today in the Coconut Grove neighborhood of Miami, uh, just there you could see the Biscayne Bay. Um, uh, it was built largely by Bahamian workers um, and by other black laborers. Um, and the, the, you know, the, the man who built the, um, who, who, who owned, right, uh, the villa, um, James Deering, whose own sexuality has been kind of the question of, of lots of things to and from, you know, since the time he was around, people called him a bachelor, which was often at the time a kind of coded word or perhaps not so coded word um, for somebody who perhaps was or wasn't all these sorts of kind of possibilities. Um, it was during his lifetime and even after, in the 60s at some point, a newspaper said that he was a, a prissy bachelor who preferred bourbon over women. I mean, there are all these kind of interesting ways that people kind of coded. Um, it was known and unknown, and, but it was also always generally kind of understood. Um, he invited his friend John Singer Sargent to come to Vizcaya in 1917, that's when he painted this, and he spent quite a bit of time uh, uh, kind of detailing in these watercolors uh, the Black Bahamian laborers um, who, who built it. Um, and if, if I kind of put these things in conversation with one another, as I see that Black Bahamian men uh, are, are overrepresented in a lot of criminal cases, not just with sodomy, but for vagrancy. Uh, sometimes they're committed to the state hospital in Northern Florida um, for a number of things, sometimes because, right, uh, homosexuality is understood as a mental illness. Uh, I, these are some of, this is some of the research that I did. I went to the state archives of Florida and found medical records for who was being, um, you know, put in these institutions, why they were being put in these institutions. Um, sometimes it led to things like circumcision, sometimes other things that were uh, really kind of violent, of course. Um, but this is a, to understand the history of, of these places outside of understanding race relations, for example, right, that as Black Bahamian laborers, they were uh, subject to not just Jim Crow, you know, this was welcome to fairyland, that is, it was a kind of white leisure place. Miami was the kind of Las Vegas of its day, Las Vegas of its day, what happened in Miami kind of stayed in Miami, and you can go to this fairyland and do as you wish if you were a certain person, if you were white, if you were, you know, middle class or upper class, right? Um, or if you had the aspiration and the possibility of, 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 of you know, passing in, in those kind of categories, you know, an aspirational middle class or something. Um, the beaches themselves, right, which were such a, a commodity, 
course that was unique to South Florida um, in many ways. Uh, these weren't available to, to often immigrants, but of course to, to, to black folks, Bahamian and, and otherwise. Um, so this idea of welcoming to Fairland, which is the kind of thread of the book, is about how different people, how different groups experience this space. Um, for, for these kind of white elite people like um, James Deering, uh, whose sexuality at the time we don't know, you know, he, uh, people have kind of been really interested in it. Um, but his chief, the, the main architect, um, Paul Schalfen, who was one of the builders of Vizcaya, um, he lived openly as a gay man in South Florida during this period in the 1910s and early 1920s with his lover, Louis Coons. Um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, who was a, you know, of course, today probably best known uh, as, the, as one of the women uh, and one of the people who saved uh, the Everglades, right, or really kind of defended the Everglades. Um, she was, of course, also a journalist uh, early on in Miami Herald, and she wrote openly about them as a couple. Um, it, it, this really interesting things that um, kind of get lost to us in history. Um, but there's no doubt that the way that some of this was made possible was through white privilege, right? That, you know, um, that, that some of these white elites, even though they were, they were queer or open, living openly with their same sex partner, um, were able to do so because, of their, um, because, of their, because they were white. Um, that there was a radically different history uh, for, uh, for black women and black men, for immigrants, uh, for a lot of working class people. Um, and this is kind of what I traced throughout the book. Great, great. So um, just, if you can just read the next paragraph or two about, sure. yeah. So some cultural observances delineated through class and gender divisions in both the Bahamas and Miami marked Bahamian men and their bodily comportment as transgressive and outside the norm. Returning Bahamians often showed off their newfound fame and fortune that they had procured in Miami or the promised land, which was how they called it, um, by dressing flashily back on the islands. The splendid appearance, and this is a quote, of the boys from the state stood out in striking contrast to us ill-fashionably clad country lads, remembered one man. Oftentimes, this consumerist seduction spurred first-time sojourners to make the trek to Miami. Another observer noted how returning migrants brought some extraordinary clothes, and that is now de rigor, to change three times on Sunday. Those who returned to the islands claimed a government official from Eleuthera, which is a part of, of course, the northern uh, part of the Bahamas, spent their time in idleness, lounging from place to place, airing their acquired ill manners and fantastically made clothes. In the early 1910s, an official from Exuma District complained about the disturbances of the peace and cited uh, the returning migrants as the cause. Their exodus forced Bahamian officials to apply firm measures to restore order. British colonial, at this time, right, the Bahamas is a, is a British colony, um, uh, believed that Miami, as well as greater access to capital, right, these people were earning higher wages in South Florida than they were in the Bahamas, had corrupted the Bahamian migrants. One of the things I, I do here um, is really just kind of look at how these waves of, of migrants, and they often were seasonal. So this idea, a lot of people were uh, were really adamant about kind of closing the borders to Bahamians and others during this period. This is in the 1910s, the period, uh, no doubt before that and a little bit after that, of kind of closing the U.S. borders. Um, but this was often understood as desirable labor. It was uh, seasonal agricultural work. And for the most part, they, they kind of sold it to, uh, to policymakers as not being permanent, um, even as some Bahamians did ultimate, ultimately decide to stick around and, and, and settle in South Florida. Um, there was this kind of difficult history of, of excluding women, uh, Black Bahamian women at the borders uh, during this period. Um, they often understood, if a woman came to, from the Bahamas, uh, a Black Bahamian woman tried to come on her own to, to South Florida during this time that is unaccompanied, if she was single or unmarried, um, she was often likely excluded at the U.S. border through this kind of broad charge that actually still exists in a number of different ways um, called the likely to become a public charge. Um, if that sounds vaguely familiar, there's a, an expansion of that recently with the Trump administration uh, to see, to kind of expand the public charge clause to exclude people from uh, receiving permanent residency, a green card, um, if you're found to have used anybody, uh, to, have, to have used any kind of social services um, that have been historically available to, to people who are, you know, potentially trying to get a green card. Um, that is, the reason I bring that up is that, you know, these histories are, this, that's over a hundred years ago, uh, the way that I'm talking about these black Bahamian women who were excluded for the likely to become a public charge. 
Um, but they, they find a way into our laws today. Um, they're not, they're not, you know, this is not a thing of the past entirely. Yeah, no, and the analogy, of course, to today is really very profound in the sense that you see many uh, farmers or hotel chains or a variety of people who, who want, um, they want to attract people from other countries to come to the United States to do work that they can't get someone to do, or they say they can. And then they're treated disrespectfully and not able to allow citizenship or, or the ability to be in here or, or to be in the United States legally. That's right. That's right. I mean, um, I think this is, you know, one of the many reasons, right, that it's so critical that uh, we put all these things in conversation with, them, with one another. That is, immigration, for example, has always been a queer issue. Um, and for us to imagine it as being kind of isolated from or as being, you know, it only applies to some or is, is, is you know, um, I think problematic, but um, it's, it's been a, it's been a key part of shaping the way that we understand uh, sex and, and understand sexual behavior for, for a long time to say nothing about the way that we police certain people's bodies. And, and um, there's a long history there that, that we still have a lot to understand. Yes, of course, of course. And, you know, as you've said, um, of course, actions, same-sex actions, uh, both among male and female, obviously have been going on for, for um, tens of thousands of years. But the whole idea of homosexuality um, was really, I think the word wasn't developed until Germany sometime in like the 1860s or 1870s. Um, 1869, yeah. Yep. And, and it's, I always find it interesting that homosexual was, was actually um, crafted first before heterosexual was. Yeah. Uh, and it's sort of an interesting phenomenon. But let's go back to uh, page 38 of your book. And um, because a lot of what we're talking about here is not about the sex per se, but the fact that sex can be a, that it can be a defining force of what's going on, and and you're and you're t talking about the queer c culture in Miami at this time, and so it's interesting that Florida passed an anti-sodomy law as early as 1842, and um, so read for us, if you will, some some of that section uh, about the early laws here in Florida on page 38. Yeah. Um, so this is a little bit of essentially legal history of the way that uh, sodomy was uh, both understood, but also prosecuted and criminalized in the state of Florida um, as it becomes right a state in the in the in the mid in the, in the 1840s uh, and beyond. Um, so men who have uh, I'll read here men who had sex with other men could be arrested under Florida's sodomy and crime against nature laws. Even, those, even though these charges proved difficult to establish and appeared infrequently in Miami's dockets during this period. In 1842, two decades after Florida passed its rape law, Florida's Legislative Council formally wrote sodomy into the state's criminal code. This is not unusual. It was based on English common law. The state's first and most draconian sodomy law punished those, and I will quote, who shall commit buggery or sodomy with either human being or beast. The perpetrator would be a judge guilty of felony and shall suffer death. There was a there was capital punishment there. Um, this also partially amended the criminal code pertaining to the application of common law, which had implicitly covered sodomy for years. That limited punishment to a $500 fine or a 12 month imprisonment. This reveals that the council understood that sodomy had been criminalized in the statute for over 20 years, while also affirming a desire um, to drastically increase the stakes for committing the offense, right, to make the punishment worse. In 1845, lawmakers excluded those who had been convicted of sodomy or buggery from being a witness or from giving evidence in any civil or criminal case. Florida legislators amended the state sodomy law again in 1868. While the crime could no longer be punished by death, it remained a felony, and the amendment included harsher language. I should note, it remained a felony in Florida until 1971. Um, whoever, and it, now it has this, in this moment in 1868, it has this harsher language. Whoever commits the abom abominable and detestable crime against nature, either with mankind or with any beast, shall be in, uh, punished by imprisonment not exceeding 20 years, read the law. By invoking the common law crime against nature taxonomy, the law particularly defined sodomy, 
which at this point primarily targeted homosexual acts between men and in Florida was limited to anal sex, that is, it didn't include oral sex just yet, until the 1920s as unnatural and contrary to normal and traditional feelings or behaviors. The way that oral sex plays a role in all of this changes quite a bit over time. Um, oral sex, for example, becomes more popular uh, for, for straight and gay people, right, more generally after the 1910s uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, it's hygiene gets improves, for example, things like the invention of the zipper help for, for you know, performing oral sex on a man. Uh, uh, also, there's VD campaigns. There's this kind of mythology that oral sex somehow during World War I, uh, that oral sex somehow is, is, is uh, immune from STIs and STDs, so from venereal disease. So there's this kind of uh, belief, of course, incorrect, that um, at this time that's pretty popular, that makes people think that oral sex somehow is safer um, in terms of, or uh, immune, uh, that is, from, from, from venereal disease. And oral sex as a kind of concept uh, increases significantly by the 1910s and 1920s. Yes, and as you and as you point out in the book, of course, you know, again there were more improvements and impr improvements in quotes to the to the statute uh, in Florida in 1917, and then of course a lot happened in the 1950s with something known as the Purple Pamphlet. For for me, the importance of of understanding this background is that when we imagine what the culture was like, and we imagine the relationships between individuals that they were doing it within a context of what was probably most important to them from an intimate standpoint mm. as being clearly, clearly illegal. And it was, it was a situation that they had to be up against all the time. I th that's exactly right. And it's, it's, it's this really interesting and, and very difficult um, you know, situation where uh, the state, for example, uh, never really defines what it means. What is a crime against nature, for example? I mean, uh, this is why in 1917, the legislature in Florida tries to create a separate law, the Lewd and Lascivious Act. Um, that's essentially a mis it's essentially the same thing as what they defined as a crime against nature, but it's no longer a felony, it's a misdemeanor. Um, so the kind of, it's easier to prove a misdemeanor, a misdemeanor, uh, it's, easier, it's easier in the court, it's less expensive to prosecute. Um, but what we find happen is that there's such a, a, an animosity and a hostility towards same-sex sex in general um, that, that ultimately the court rules that fellatio and then later in the 40s cunnilingus, so oral sex performed on a woman, is a crime against nature felony anyway. That is, the, the legislature creates a, a, a kind of statute specifically to prosecute oral sex. And there's the, the, the Supreme Court is so appalled by the idea of same-sex sex, sex um, and, and oral sex in some ways more broadly, um, that they continue, they, they find that that too is a crime against nature. And they actually rather prosecute under the felony rather than the misdemeanor. So one of the things I did was look at, uh, for all of its vagueness, and that's why, by the way, that 1971 becomes an important year, uh, they ruled that the, the felony was unconstitutional. Um, and they were like, but don't worry, we'll continue to prosecute it because there's already a law uh, against lewd and lascivious behavior that's been covering this all along, but it's a misdemeanor. And they continue to prosecute it that way um, in, in the 70s, beyond the 70s. Um, but there's this, uh, you know, the unmentionables, they often talk about this in the vaguest of ways. They, this, the courts, the, the judges are so um, uncomfortable even talking about what this is that it just creates such ambiguity that it's really difficult to understand what it is they're, they're uh, criminalizing in the first place. Um, and I should note that the law itself, of course, is subject to um, just as society is, right, in some ways as a reflection of it or, you know, kind of imposition of it, to sexism. Uh, uh, cunnilingus, oral sex performed on a woman, isn't uh, clarified in this uh, until the 40s. That is, it's not like women weren't uh, receiving oral sex at all, although right, sexist, uh, you know, sexist behavior, no doubt, dictated social patterns. Um, but, but the Supreme Court, the Florida Supreme Court, which would take up the idea of sodomy five times um, from, from the early 1900s uh, to 1940, five times, it, it, that's a lot, um, you know, for it to decide what sodomy is, what crime against nature is, what is oral sex, you know, a part of this taxonomy, it's, 
it, it just shows this kind of um, un discomfort around it. And, and ultimately, it's, it's, it's vague, it's, it's ambiguous, um, and they prosecute people regardless. Um, but for the most part, what we find happen in places like Miami and other places uh, throughout Florida is that since these were really difficult to prosecute and really difficult to prove um, more generally, most people who engage in same-sex sex during this period were most often uh, uh, criminalized through local ordinances, um, through kind of vaguer, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, all-encompassing things like, uh, you know, even things like vagrancy uh, or, or, you know, disorderly conduct, you know, a number of different kind of broad charges in which one could be unbecoming of, you know, uh, a U.S. citizen or something. Well, that's a good segue. And let's talk a little bit about prohibition uh, in Miami uh, and uh, set, that up, uh, set that up for us a little bit about prohibition in Miami and the clubs uh, and bars and places that uh, people would have frequented and particularly those that gay people uh, would have fr frequent. Of course, they weren't gay then. They were Yes. or they were whatever they, whatever they were called at the time. You know, and in this period, so Prohibition 1920 to 1933 officially, right, people are increasingly coming to terms with uh, uh, new forms of sexual practices, right? The 1920s especially, uh, as already, I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier about oral sex, for example, uh, women great, take greater public ownership of their bodies. So in places like Miami, things like, you know, we take this for granted in many ways today, but it was, it was a, a really bold statement, right? Uh, for, for women to uh, talk about sex at all, to talk about pleasure at all. Um, for women, it, it was actually criminalized in Miami Beach in, in different variations and manifestations well into the 50s to, uh, to you know, banning women from wearing two-piece bathing suits, right? Um, so all sorts of different ways that people policed, uh, you know, sexuality at large. But Miami was also interesting because, as I noted earlier, and this is why, you know, the Welcome to Fairyland concept, uh, what happened in Miami, you know, kind of stayed in Miami. And uh, one of the ways that, uh, you know, people promote, you know, the local politicians, those, the real estate investors, the kind of urban boosters at large promoted Miami was by saying, like, here, even if just temporarily, you could do all sorts of things that you can't do up north, you can't do. Some of this included experimenting, exploring sexually, uh, you know, whether it be kind of just change the way that you dress, whether you dress in more vibrant colors, or if you went to a different part of town and you found a gay club and perhaps, uh, you know, a different place that you might kind of find different cultures that otherwise were unknown to you or you had only read about in places like, um, you know, pulp novels were really big during this time. Uh, and Miami was, was a, a really common backdrop for a lot of pulp novels. And they often include lots of, you know, queer characters, people who, including sex workers, right? Um, so prohibition also has a kind of different flair in some ways in Miami uh, because of its relationship to, to Cuba. For instance, uh, Miami was never really dry, right? The prohibition of alcohol, uh, it was, you could find alcohol in South, in South Florida very, very easily. And part of that, it was being filtered uh, through, uh, you know, essentially illicit trade from the Bahamas. Um, but also Miami understood the politicians, the police officers understood that if you didn't cater to uh, and didn't make possible a pretty wide open town where you could do all these sorts of things, that people would take their business elsewhere, especially to places like Havana, uh, which had a really growing reputation as, as being kind of a city of vice, of sex, of, of, of corruption, and a lot of other things, right? Largely through the lens of US imperialism. Um, so they didn't have prohibition laws, for example. So if you don't let me drink in Miami, I'll take my dollars or pesos um, down to Havana and drink there. So it kind of nudged Miami into being, you know, we'll look the other way. And during tourist season, which back then, right, nobody wanted to be in Miami during the summer, uh, really November till March or early April. During that time, a lot of these places ran uninterrupted. A lot of these gay bars during Prohibition and after Prohibition just weren't policed. They just allowed them to, to kind of take shape and, and to do what they wanted to do. They included drag, they included sex workers, they included, you know, dancing of, of you know, people could dance, they, uh, they had essentially what you know we think of today as drag queens but back then was known as female impersonators and male impersonators it was these really thriving queer cultures that had a lot to do with prohibition and the end of prohibition in 1933. Um, 
I want to, I don't know how much time I have, but if I could just read about two paragraphs, three paragraphs about, um, there was this really- Please do, please, please do. It, it is in, it's interesting though, as you go around this, because I think as some of the um, people who are trying to dissuade others yeah. and, and refer to these as vices, saying as far as drink and sex and all those things were, were going, what they were actually doing we're advertising why people should come to Miami. That's, that's right. I mean, isn't that the kind of, you know, fun part about all of this and telling us what not to do. You're also giving me a really great guide for what I should be doing or perhaps what I would like to be doing. At least that's the way I think about it. <laughs> um, okay, go ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead. <laughs> so there was just to kind of give this, this was a raid um, in 1937 of a, of a gay bar known as La Paloma. Um, Patrons of Miami's popular La Paloma Club paid for a night of sexual thrills and entertainment. When national prohibition ended in 1933, liquor flowed even more freely than before in dry and name only Miami. Fears of prosecution for selling alcohol, particularly among small time illicit traders who constituted the, the bulk of those harassed by authorities, it dissipated. Bootlegging, however, did not. Prohibition had taught Miami businesses that operating outside the law remained most profitable. Such was the case with La Paloma. There, women wearing G-strings and brassiers dance and stripped on stage. There, uh, other immoral performers, and that's a quote, included female impersonators and queers who treated audiences to quote indecent jokes and songs. La Paloma was, among many other things, a queer establishment that was increasingly understood to be gay. So long as tourists and others sought titillating entertainment, Miami businessmen like Al Yost, who was the operator of La Paloma, were happy to oblige. On the evening of November 15, 1937, as music blared, backlights dimmed, dancers gyrated and glasses clinked, dozens of women and men forced their way into the club. Even though it was a Monday night, attendance and sales were strong. It was, after all, the beginning of tourism season, of tourist season. The intruders dressed from head to toe in long white hooded robes meant to strike fear in the hearts of the club's customers and their staff. The club orchestra kept playing. They believed it was all part of an act. They soon learned, however, that La Paloma had been raided. This raid had been conducted not by local law enforcement, but by nearly 200 members of the local Ku Klux Klan, the KKK. The mob burned a fiery cross in front of the establishment located in an unincorporated section of Northwest Miami, and reports claim they stormed into the club, smashed the tables and chairs, and ordered all patrons and employees be searched for weapons. They then compelled the patrons to leave and threatened to burn the place down if they did not comply. KKK members reportedly roughed up some of the, of the workers, including choking three girl entertainers and manhandling a waiter, those were quotes. The terrorists believed everyone connected to the establishment was guilty of immorality and threaten the city's moral fabric. Alan Mack. Wow. Um, <laughs> so is there more history to that particular story in that night when the KKK came? So I, I note here, for example, that it wasn't officially conducted by the local law enforcement. It seems very likely that some of the people who wore the hood that night, right? Um, and this tells us a lot about the, the significant uh, connections, right, between um, racial violence and anti-LGBTQ violence and the ways that all of these things are interconnected in really critical ways. Um, the police, this is not, I mean, some people talk about the raid. Stonewall, of course, right, was a, was a, was a uh, mafia-operated um, gay bar as well. It seems likely that La Paloma was too, um, which is not unusual, right? A lot of early gay bars, certainly in the 60s and, and but also before that, this is 1937, were kind of underground. Like the idea of prohibition essentially helped create ideas of, of the prolific underground and you know putting them in parts of the bars. And there's, there's earlier histories to that. Um, I have to say after writing this book, so I curated this big exhibition for History Miami Museum called Queer Miami, a history of, of LGBTQ communities. Um, I actually learned even more that if people shared stories, and this is one of the things I love about doing community history is that this is this is our history and there's so much out there that exists in people's basements and you know, stories and letters and uh, people have shared new stories with me and new sources with me. Uh, and one of the things I found out later through kind of other connections 
um, was that, so this, they shut it down, the police raid it as well. Again, there might've been very clear overlap between the Klan and the police or parts of the police anyway. That was not unusual for the South. Um, uh, but I find this to be, and maybe this is a great way of kind of linking us back to resilience. Uh, Cause I think, I always think very strongly about queer resistance and queer resilience. Um, they couldn't shut this down for very long. Um, it was just closed a few, just a few weeks and they reopened. And um, Life magazine, right, a, a mainstream press, uh, re, you know, uh, told this story about this raid, which had been completely lost to us. That is, as I was in the archives, I was like, what? This is such, a, such an important story. The raid of a gay bar in Miami in 1937 um, had been entirely lost to us. Um, but in this Life story, in this Life magazine story, we find out that the performers, these queer performers and others there, um, were they were practicing for a new routine, a new kind of, uh, you know, act for, for the club, um, where they, the queer performers themselves, wore the hood. Um, that is, they kind of, they, you know, here was the clan saying, you know, you're gonna, uh, we're gonna, t we're gonna terrorize you, we're gonna take, you know, we're gonna shut you down if you don't, if you don't, you know, cease to exist in our city, uh, we will, we will, you know, get rid of you, right? We'll find different ways of getting rid of you. There's the story of racial violence and sexual violence. It's all kind of connected here. Um, and in, as it is in, really in history. Uh, and the queer performers say, you think you're gonna scare us? You think you're gonna intimidate us? We're gonna kind of like take that power away from you. And they, they created it, they recreated the act in this queer way, right? So suddenly, uh, to me, that just, that shows the kind of resilience, the resistance. Um, it's a powerful story of how um, you know, how, the t how on earth do you tell, I kind of mentioned this a little earlier, but I think it's, it's really important to stress, how do you tell the story of people whose lives were never meant to, to you know, be recorded, who, it, you know, it was in the state's interest to erase these people from history, uh, to, to exclude them from our history books, from our narratives, from our understanding of the past. Um, and in every single way, they challenge that um, in their protests and their, um, in, in everything, they, they made it so that we would not forget them. Um, and I, I find that to be a powerful testament to, to how we should act today. Absolutely great. Just as a reminder to everybody, uh, we'll be finishing up at, at, at 7.30, uh, uh, which is about 13 minutes from now. And so if you have questions, go ahead and start posting them. Uh, and we can start looking at those questions and answer those. And just a reminder to everyone too, uh, to be sure to sign up for our newsletter for uh, stonewall-museum.org to keep on getting notices about these events because they really have been great. Uh, maybe one last section of the book um, and then we'll go to the questions. Um, do you wanna read or talk a little bit about Mother Kelly's and the jewel or the jewel box? Sure, I mean, I'm happy to talk. I guess I'll talk about Mother Kelly. So Mother Kelly, uh, just because it's great show and tell, and I put it here next to me. Um, one of the things that I've done, again, is kind of collect things across, you know, in the museum exhibition that I did, for example, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, the resources come from Stonewall, right, uh, where I was an intern 15 years ago. It's been such a special place to me and so many others. Um, but it's also kind of uh, resources that I've kind of come across over the years and kind of built my own archive in this way with things people have shared with me and stories that people have shared with me. Uh, Mother Kelly's was a popular night spot in, in Miami Beach and uh, it was really started in the late 30s uh, and into in the mid 40s. Um, and Mother Kelly's was kind of mainstream. It was meant obviously mostly for tourists. Uh, it was seasonal, so it would shut down in the summers. It was not unusual for a lot of places to do that. Um, but Mother Kelly's, and this is, you know, Time Magazine talked about this, local newspapers talked about this. Um, they would say he's, you know, she's no woman at all, but rather, um, a man, and you know, he's a he, uh, and it's, it's this performance, an Irishman, an, an immigrant, uh, Robert Kelly, uh, here's a piggy bank, I own three of these now, um, here's <laughs> Mother Kelly's, who, uh, who not just served drinks, but also um, performed uh, in drag for, um, for the audience, which was, again, mostly tourists, um, but one of the things that I love is the kind of playful nature, by the way, this was also one of the most kind of popular places uh, for servicemen during World War II. They loved Mother Kelly's. Um, again, that played, you know, was mostly drag, a lot of drag performances. The playfulness of sexuality here, this is again a piggy bank, and I want to show you, I'm going to unveil this in a very dramatic fashion, um, where one would insert the coin, like the coin slot for a piggy bank, very playfully suggested <laughs> um, in Mother Kelly's buttocks. Um, the kind of playfulness here of sexuality, of, of 
what else might be penetratable under the space. Um, whatever Mother Kelly's sexual proclivities or identity is, we don't know. But this helped kind of suggest a culture that was emerging, right? That there were, if you saw this and you perhaps, right, were also thinking about same-sex sex, if you had same-sex desires, this helped combat things like isolation, that you were not alone, that there was a, a, a people who were like you and people who thought like you, um, whether that was true or not, or, or you know, whether you were able to come to these spaces, these kinds of, of, of you know, material objects were really important to help creating a community. Um, and these things, you know, this is not that anomalous. Yeah, no, it's so amazing. And of course, as we keep on saying around here, it's, you know, history is written based upon objects like that. Yeah. What, those will have to be interpreted, you know, later. And so it's great. Um, okay, so we're getting some more questions. Uh, and so first question here is, uh, let me go over here to questions. Um, what are you currently working on? So I'm currently working on, uh, I'm doing a, a, a new exhibition with the Wilsonian uh, Museum in South Beach uh, with Global AIDS posters, um, which I'm really excited about, It'll be entirely digital. Um, and I'm essentially writing what happens in gay Miami post-1945, so revising that dissertation. So I don't think of it as a sequel in any way, but essentially what Miami looks like post-1940s into the present day. Uh, all, this will all be for popular audiences. Um, and I'm also doing a book about immigration history that essentially tells the, the story of immigration law in the United States uh, from the 1890s to the present but told through the lens of LGBTQ immigrants. Um, and I, I, it's a, it's a, these are, you know, these are works that are of course very meaningful to me um, and that, that I, uh, I'm an I'm a LGBTQ historian, but I'm equally a historian of race relations, of immigration, uh, of carcer, you know, the incarcerality. So it's, a, these are questions that I care very deeply about. And um, I'm fortunate that people get to, the people share their, their stories with me. So it's, it's a, it's a group project. Um, sure. yeah. The next question was more, uh, some more stories in history uh, about lesbians in Miami or the transgender community. Yeah, so I mean, some of these in this earlier period, right, again, it's the reason I kind of hesitated to use the word lesbian or use the, the word um, uh, gay even, right, is that these are not the way that people necessarily saw themselves, um, but uh, that is like with the identity particularly. Um, but we, sh I think it's important that we understand, uh, like one of the performers for, I didn't get to talk about it, but write the um, Jewel Box Review, which was this important kind of review, uh, you know, it was a local club, it was the Jewel Box Club in, in, in Miami Beach on, off the Venetian Causeway that went on tour, right? People um, that fe featured uh, female impersonators, what was then known as female impersonators and male impersonators. Some of those people today we'd understand closer to transgender, uh, one of those male impersonators that got their start in, in, in Florida and then on the tour uh, was Stormé de Lavare, who was um, a, a mixed race, was, was a black woman, a butch lesbian, who was also one of the, the you know, pioneers, for example, of um, uh, uh, in Stonewall. She was a Stonewall veteran, right? It's possible she might have been one of the first, one of the first people to throw the brick or whatever, you know, like whatever the story changes, you know, through a number of different ways, uh, but might have been one of the catalysts for, for the riot anyway. I mean, it has their start here in South Florida. Um, I, there's also a story about, uh, I, I, can, I know I'm running out of time, but I'll be very brief. Uh, Joanne Gilbert, who's a famous film actress, uh, she performed locally in South Beach uh, and, and parts of, you know, uh, downtown Miami for a long time. Uh, she, she protested uh, the laws, uh, the local ordinances in South Florida, um, I love this story, um, that largely, again, the laws themselves were sexist, right? They, sometimes they didn't criminalize lesbian behavior the same way they criminalized gay men's behavior because of the sexism. That is, they didn't even understand women as sexual beings, right? So they can't imagine that lesbians could even exist in some instances, right? Uh, and Joanne Gilbert got on a stage um, and protested this 1952 local ordinance in Miami that prohibited men uh, from wearing uh, women's clothing, essentially, right? Uh, so in this way, uh, what we might, targeting not just uh, gay men, but also trans people, right? People who are also transgressing gender norms. Um, and Joanne Gilbert uh, stood up on the stage and dressed up as a man saying, what I'm doing now is not illegal because you don't even see me as a person, right? Like you don't understand that, that uh, queer women also exist. And it's such a powerful testament, I think, to 
uh, to the way that women challenged right parts of the law that trans people continue to to challenge the law um, and and made themselves visible right if you if the state itself didn't want uh, you to you know to, would try to erase me made sure that they were not erased um, so much of this book and so much of the exhibition and, and the work I do uh, centers on trans people and and, and women's lives uh, so it's, it's it's certainly a big part of all of this yeah, I know it's obviously a very important part, and we've only touched in this forty-five minutes. We've we've really only touched just on some very, uh, just very few, just sort of the icing on top of the cake. There's so many. There's so many great stories that you tell in here. Um, why did you end in in 1940 in the book? You know, for a number of reasons. One really being that Miami changes really significantly. Uh, Miami is kind of uh, so much of the story is framed around it being a fairyland. This kind of largely tourist driven economy. And that changes a lot by, by the 40s and 50s. The Cold War helps change a lot of that. Um, it's also just because after the 40s, people increasingly start seeing themselves as lesbian, as gay, as bisexual, as transgender. Um, and we move into a kind of different moment uh, where, uh, where you're able to think more about people's identities, which I, again, is not really the focus of this earlier part because I don't I never want to impose what I think someone may or may not have felt, um, but rather their experiences. So here I'm kind of covering uh, people's experiences, their histories, largely through um, the, the things that they did, right? Um, as opposed to necessarily the, the way that they identified, which is not, again, what all we do with post-1945 history, but in some ways, right, we get to go to places like Stonewall uh, that record histories of, of people who are self-identified as gay, as lesbian, as bisexual, as transgender. In this earlier period, it's, it's really kind of recovering a lot of um, pieces and fragments of things that, like that Mother Kelly thing is, is you know, the piggy bank I showed you, for example. Um, people might have seen that and not understood it as queer, right? May not have under, immediately kind of uh, understood that that was a, a drag, right? A, a drag performance, right? Um, People who were in the know, however, did. Um, and this is what, you know, kind of what Fairyland meant, that for people in the know, you know, you might be able to find that gay bar in unincorporated Miami. Somebody might tell you exactly where it is. But for others, it just meant that you could play golf in the, in the sunny, you know, environment. Um, so it was, you know, kind of different experiences for different people. Yeah, it's uh, obviously different things uh, for different people. And speaking of which, there's another question here. Um, maybe this will be our last one. Uh, just if you could comment a little bit on whether Jewish LGBTQ individuals or other minorities were treated any differently uh, in Miami at the time. So, so certainly I there's a great deal of evidence, of course, the anti-Semitism of Miami in its earlier period, you know, no doubt, and to say nothing about right post 1940s as well. Um, for the period that I studied, right, so much of segregation is also based, right, you know, it's not uncommon to find parts of South Florida that said Gentiles only, right? Um, that is the kind of restrictions based on race uh, that were also uh, stratified and, and segregated um, against Jewish people and, and, and certainly people of color, working class people. There's a, there's a lot of, you know, Miami was a deeply and often in many ways remains a deeply segregated place. Um, where we see greater kind of alliances, for example, between the experience of being a uh, Jewish American and kind of connections to the LGBTQ community is actually right in the, in the post 1940s, 1950s. Uh, one of the best examples, right, is the, the kind of fight uh, during the Anita Bryant campaign, for example, the 1977 campaign, uh, the commissioner, Ruth Schack, of course, understood so much of her, uh, who proposed this really progressive legislation um, to, to bar discrimination based on uh, what was then known as sexual, uh, sexual preference um, in housing accommodations and, uh, you know, really kind of borrowing from civil rights legislation. Um, she understood the kind of need to, to, to create that space um, for for LGBTQ people um, through her own experience as a Jewish woman. Um, and that was not uncommon for lots of Jewish activists as well in the 70s. Bob Koontz, for example, is, is one of them, one of the kind of key figures um, in, the, in the campaign uh, that Anita Bryant launches known as Save Our Children uh, to overturn that really progressive ordinance. Um, so there's no doubt lots of connections uh, between kind of building movements and momentum. Uh, no doubt uh, people also learn not just from the women's movement, uh, also, of course, through the uh, Black Civil Rights Movement, that all this is kind of building towards something uh, larger for, for liberation for all. 
Yeah, that makes to total sense. One last question. What, question. what parallels uh, did you find between development of queer culture in Miami and in Cuba, especially from the 1940s onward? Yeah, so 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 much kind of change. So I would say that there's a lot of things, that there's key connections. It was not uncommon for uh, for people to tour, for example, right? Like, you know, performers would go to places like Havana uh, and places like uh, South Florida. Um, you know, with the advent of, 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 of flight, right? Like when people begin to do air travel, um, commercial air travel by the late 1920s, early 1930s, getting to Cuba is actually fairly easy, right? Um, so a lot of people uh, essentially kind of make a, a an un, you know, kind of understand South Florida as an, a key pit stop. And, and South Florida, you know, advertises and markets itself um, in that way that before you get to Cuba, come to Miami or on your way back home to wherever, right? Come to Miami, um, where you'll see essentially an extension of, of Cuba. And one of the ways that they do this often is by, by advertising that things in, in really kind of racist ways, I have to, you know, very clearly say, um, by saying that people are safer in South Florida. Um, it, it's usually through kind of racialized language that uh, you know, it's just, it's at least you have the security of being in the U.S. borders and, and uh, the kinds of things that come along with that. But the tourist markets in places like Havana and places like Miami are really indelibly linked uh, in the 30s and 40s um, and, and would remain so through the 50s until, of course, the, the Cuban Revolution of 1959 uh, and where everything would change again. Of course. Julio, thank you so much for being here. This was a wonderful chat. It seems like we just got started, as they say, and then <laughs> it's time to, to go. Thank you to all of you for being here. Um, be sure to visit uh, stonewall-museum.org to get a complete listing of all of our um, all of our virtual presentations. We'll be doing these through the course of the summer. If you don't get our newsletter, you can sign up on the website as well too. We'll be opening the library uh, part-time in two weeks, and so we're very happy about that. And if you have any other suggestions for people you'd like to hear from, uh, just shoot us an email. You can find the email addresses on the website. And also today's talk will is being recorded, and so um, we will be posting that up on the website in the next week or two. And a big shout out to Emery Grant. Thank you, Emery, for uh, helping out and making this all happen. There's Emery, hello, Emery. Thank you, Emery. Um, and uh, thanks for making all that happen. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Bye, everyone.